I say like swinging uh, like the first few hours you are like in the red. You have like a sickening stomach feeling, even if you risk like one percent and have everything calculated. Does that ever go away in your, in your experience or does it stay sure. like that? Is it part of the game? Uh, I, I definitely know what you're all about because yeah, I went through that and it's I think everyone probably here is the same to be fair. Like when you're especially with swing trading, because um, you know, if you're going for like for example an average entry, and a, a good example is the trade that I'm in today, right? Um, and I actually had this on, on video of behind the scenes and I was going for a swing trade uh, because I entered originally into this short uh, from the beginning of yesterday. I was underwater yesterday on this position for around four thousand um, dollars. And whether it's this trade or any other trade, like when I'm going, it depends. Sometimes I'm going for like a sniper entry, but if I'm going for like an average entry and like you're underwater for a little bit, and like this is a good example because I was four thousand dollars underwater and now it's thirteen thousand in profit. Uh, in like one day. So what the what I would say is that it's really, really, really important to just trust the plan that you're you're in. So you just have to know that like very, very like I would even say when it comes to swing trade, you could say like 99% of the time you're gonna have to go for a period of drawdown like underwater because it's unlikely that you're gonna get the exact like dollar high. So like as it comes to your entry, you know you've got that zone of where you're entering maybe you're laddering maybe you're going for one entry um but all the time you're going to have that stop loss like let's say two percent away so if you are moves up one percent and you're in one percent drawdown and obviously you're in the red and i know what you mean by like that scary feeling like you're feeling upset like the trade's going to lose it's just so important to like trust the plan that you've got into and i would say just know that you just have to accept yourself that you're not going to get that exact dollar high and so that red like pnl that's going to show uh of course it could come up and hit the stop loss and you could get invalidated and you would just have to accept that that's totally fine and it's cool that like it's fine that it hit the stop loss it was just the one of the losing trades and then you look for the next like 10 ahead right and so the the feeling of like like that sadness feeling when you're in that temporary red i would say definitely goes away as you become like just really confident in your trading plans. Like I was yesterday on this trade, four thousand dollars underwater, but I was not scared or worried about it. So I'm just like, well, I, I know where I'm wrong on this trade. And if it hits the invalidation, it hits the invalidation. But um, yeah, I would just say like through time and like knowing that your trading plan that you're working with and your strategy that you're using is successful in the long term, that like you've built up your through the journal and statistics. Then I would say, and I. I we can hear your opinions as well, but I would say personally that when I go into a trade, I, I know it's going to have drawdown. I know I'm not going to get the exact high every time. And so I'm I'm expecting, you could say, to see $1,000, $2,000 underwater because, and that's fine because it's not hit my invalidation. So I've, I've given myself that wiggle room, so to speak. So if I've got my entry here and my validation is above a high, where it could come up very close and that's fine as long as it doesn't hit the high and I'm invalidated. But I know that there's that space where price could come to and, and that's where people would get like scared that like close out their trade a little bit early, like thinking. And, I, and this is why I uh, put it down to is confidence. Because if you're really, really confident in your trading plan, then you are not going to close out early. You're like, well, I, I've got my entry for this reason. I know that I'm wrong here. Uh, I'm, 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 I'm I'm not happy with being in underwater because it's still following my plan and my validation is not hit. So if my validation is not hit, I don't need to close out of that trade. Whereas if you are really low on confidence uh, in the trades, and this is normal uh, as, you, as you're like going through your journey, but with low confidence, you get into that little bit of uh, red, even though your validation hasn't hit and you're already doubting yourself. You're already thinking, I took the wrong trade. This plan wasn't right. I've made a mistake. And a lot of the time people will close that trade for a loss and then it'll actually see, oh, if I just kept it going, it would have won. And I 100% I, I put it all down to like confidence. And that's why when it comes to like ego in trading, I think it's it's uh, like a separation almost, but it's good to have really big confidence in, in yourself, not just through no reason, but if you can back it up with statistics. Yeah. I, I think it's really important to be fully confident and believe in yourself and believe in the plan 
um, because otherwise I, I know 100% like you will end up closing good trades early for, for that reason of like thinking, oh, it's another loss. I might as well take a small loss now instead of uh, waiting for the stop loss to be hit when in reality there's no real reason to close it because the invalidation hasn't been hit. So that, that that's what I would say. I, I don't know if you, either of you two or Phil yeah. Scott has a different answer. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Um, so um, I agree to everything Daniel said, but um, just to reinforce that, I think what's going to help you is to keep a journal, obviously, and have a good awareness of your win rate and how that's going to change throughout weeks and even months. So I do weekly, monthly, and yearly reviews with myself. And you were asking about uh, swing trading. I think my altcoins are a good example for that because I know my exact win rate on altcoins. And whenever one of my alerts get hit, get hit, I see my trigger point. I get my confirmation. I'm taking the trade. But since it's a swing trade, I don't have to look at it every day. So I know, all right, I have above 80% win rate. So if I take this trade, it's going to be all right. So I'm just taking the trade, not looking at it every single day. And that is a difference to scalp trading, obviously, because when we are scalp trading the futures, for example, we have to see the market, we have to read order flow, sometimes we have to react. But for my swing trades, I'm taking my trades, leaving these trades, and then I will only set an alert for if my take profit one is hit or if my invalidation gets hit. Sometimes I just get my alert and see, all right, that's take profit one, but I wasn't sitting in front of my phone and seeing, all right, about to take profit or I'm close to invalidation. I just don't care about that because I have trust and confidence in my win rate. And I'll just add, I mean, you guys, that, that, that is it, but I'll just add that that second layer of feeling comfortable on that trade, like, you know, that butterfly feeling or that sick stomach, that will come with that experience. So once you go through a few a few trades, then that will kind of, okay, well, that it's fine. And that's why sometimes I call it the boxing trades, for example, because you want to kind of like maximize those profits. Um, but on swing trading, it's completely different. You just need that experience. So repetition, basically. Yeah. And you just get, like um, like anything in life, the more repetition, the better you get at it. So, yeah. No, that was a great answer. From all of you. Yeah, I just want to add a little cherry on top and say that it, that feeling doesn't ever go away, but it becomes uh, totally. less important because what becomes more important is that you know you've taken a good trade based on your statistics, based on your known setups, based on your, your own experience. And you have an invalidation set. So as long as you have an invalidation, there's only one or two things can happen. You can lose, you can win. And so that's it. Yeah. It either works or it doesn't. It works or it doesn't. Yeah. And I'd say that uh, as a younger trader, this feeling of fear may be more prevalent. But as you become more experienced, it will fade. It will fade with time. <laughs> Thank you. Great. All right. Does anyone else have a question? Thank you. My name is uh, Daniel. And my question is regarding um, the transition for, to becoming a full-time trader. So let's say you have been a member for <coughs> two or three years, you know all the theory, you have the screen time, you start to have a slowly up uh, sloping equity curve, uh, but you're still relying on your full-time job um, to cover your expenses, your life, and your trading is not yet making enough money to, to cover those expenses. How would you how do you do that step? How do you do it? Because you kind of you have to leave that comfort of that fixed salary. You get that trap of getting that money every day, every month. How do you recommend to do that transition and become full time trader? You have to continue with that cash flow. I've me I've mentioned this a few times. You have to kind of build that cash flow, and eventually you will make the transition but you have to feel comfortable and it, it doesn't happen from one month to another. That takes some serious time, but also um, there's a high percentage and we'll probably cover this later, but there's a high percentage that most traders do have alternative sources of income. Um, so this is something we'll probably talk about later, um, but it's having that um, not safety net, not, well, it kind of is really, um, but it's the, the diversification. Um, and that will be because if you go into the trading and that is your only source of income, that can be quite detrimental to your beginning career because you, you're basically just starting on to a failure because you've got to be so focused on that that you're going to lose, you know, the, the bigger picture. And so, yeah, you need to be in the right place with that nice cash flow. So the, the answer is you just have to continue that path until you are there. And, you know, there's no measure for that. I mean, it could take two years, three years. It, it depends on, you know, the individual.
Yeah, and that is such a good question that we actually wanted to dedicate one and a half hours, so a full round table to cover this question, because we anticipated that many of you are on the verge of becoming full-time traders. So um, we are going to give a very in-depth answer on all this and the different steps and what we did, our experiences. So um, just to let you know. And just to add one thing to that, I think for myself, I probably transitioned too soon. And I, let, I, I was very happy uh, transitioning. There was a bit of a honeymoon phase, right? <laughs> and then once the honeymoon phase is over, you, know, you realize, oh, I no longer have the checks coming in. I no longer have the health care provided for me. Uh, I have to do this on my own. And so you have a sense of it's make it or break it. And I will add that it puts a sense of pressure that's truly unnecessary. Yeah. And the best traders, all of the best traders that I know have alternative sources of income just because they have families to provide for, they have goals, they have uh, financial goals as well. So I'd say that just don't make the transition too soon. Mm -hmm. And also, uh, well, we'll get into this uh, in a few hours, but if you leave yourself a runway, you know, have, have some savings, you know, one, two years worth of full expenses saved, because that will be your source of confidence, knowing that even if you lose the trade today or if you lose the trade tomorrow, that you're, you're not going to be underwater and that you're not going to go broke and then, you know, have to go back to the, the world that you hate, which is, you know, a job or some, you know, source of income that you don't find as enjoyable as trading. So thank you, Daniel, for your attention. Yeah, I, I call it the emergency bucket. So always have that emergency bucket. It will make you feel good about that trade that you're taking. And it doesn't, because it's there. It's there for that reason. Um, so yeah, emergency bucket. <laughs> That's what I call it. Yeah, I'll just add a few words. I, I, I think that is an amazing point of like having a savings already saved up. Like if you go full-time trading um, and you have no savings and you're like, well, every month I'm living paycheck to paycheck. I think that is definitely going to add a lot of pressure. I would say from like my experience, um, when I went to like, like realizing that for, I want to do full-time trading, um, I had like two big tips that I think helped me like looking back. Num number one was I had the support of my family. So I knew, okay, if I fail, I'm still going to have a place to live. I could just live on my mum. And so that was a massive like help. Like my family really would uh, support me if I fully had failed. Um, I, I I would have had a, a fallback of at least like a place to live sort of thing. And on top of that, I only quit when I had um, I only like was full uh, of like okay, I'm gonna do this full time. And I'd already proven to myself that I could make money um, consistently. So like it, I, I would say like two, yeah, two main tips, like don't do it until you already can see, wow, I'm making more money in trading than I am in your job at, at the time. And then you've already got one step of confidence. Like if you can do it while you're doing it part-time, so the only thing is psychologically, like you could have more pressure on yourself, which you would have. Um, but then if you've got a fallback, like a savings pot, family, uh, something that can help you out, that would be a, a massive, uh, a massive plus and then of course diversification but i would say that doesn't come until you've been very successful well of course there's different steps of diversification right but um you know if you're talking about like really that you have to have, you know made a few mil let's say a meal a few mil before you can start to diversify properly into like real estate so that that's going to come with time but then once you've unlocked that then I think that your, your trading will go from this until like you, you can, cause you can start to, you know, take a little bit more risk, like have a little bit more confidence in the trades. Like, yeah, obviously we, we say like, obviously trade the charts, like use risk management, but I would say it does give you a little bit more freedom. If you have a hundred percent, you know, Hey, uh, at the end of the month, if I do bad this trading month, I've got, you know, a few thousand dollars coming in from the houses, then it's like, okay, you know, I, I can take a little bit more confidence. And I think like I was mentioning before, like confidence is such a big part of trading. I think sometimes if it is your sole income and you have no savings, you have no family, you have no backup, um, you're going to be so pressured. And I think you'd also become scared to take a trade because mm -hmm. you're thinking like, wow, if I lose this trade, um i could lose i could make nothing this month how am i gonna buy the groceries how am i gonna pay my rent like that's gonna be a massive massive pressure i thankfully never had that on myself but i can imagine that it would be really 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 hard um to trade 
with no other security already in place. So I, I would have thought that would be yeah. really, really difficult. And I, I would say that if anyone in the audience has gone through the step of um, having like a lower uh, security around you and you've done the transition, like if anyone here has done the transition from uh, part-time to full-time trading and they wanted to share, yes. you can do that now as well. If, if anyone has a cool tip, if not, we can move on to the next question. Does anyone want to share? Yes. Uh, yeah, just, just, just do that. Yeah, it'll be, it'll be cool to hear your, your, your viewpoint from a member's perspective. Uh, hello, my name is Robert. I have a completely other question. Um, our aim is, our aim is to, to generate profit. And um, I would like to have support or to have some information, but maybe not today, it's very difficult, I know, but how to realize profit in fiat, where to get a good bank, which, which people know that over months, maybe over years, they are, have no problems with profits from crypto. Because what I know in Dubai, I talked, I think, half a year ago, and still was it's very difficult to find even here a bank which is uh, accepting bigger volumes, bigger profits from crypto. So this, I'm, I, I have the feeling that it's a little bit close, that everybody's keeping this for himself. This would be really, really nice as a, like a family, and this, our aim is to make some one day a big money, or not big money, make money, you know, and to use this money. And I don't want to run uh, around to, to, to crypto shops and to change it in fiat. We know all that the fiat will be reduced and, um, and or to use MasterCards from buy or also nice thing. But I would like, for example, to buy an apartment or to buy a car. So this information, uh, I don't know, in a chat or private or whatever, would be very nice to know from guys who has many years experience. OK, look, this bank is cool. This country is cool. This I'm missing a little bit. Yeah, I, I, well, I would say from, from my perspective, well, obviously it's, it's got to be dependent because every, every country has their own regulations. But obviously, to find a crypto-friendly country would be beneficial and that become tax resident, live in that crypto-friendly country, join a crypto-friendly bank. Obviously, you can find that in the UAE. You can find that uh, Switzerland, I hear. You know, there, there's several different countries, but I think the main important thing is, I mean, in terms of fiat off-ramp, you know, you can use things like Coinbase, but then once you've, I, I, from my perspective, it's very simple, like uh, make money trading, send that. So for example, on Bybit, send that to Coinbase, sell the, sell the Tether to, uh, let's just say Great British Pounds, and then send that to the bank, the one bank in the UK, for example. Again, I have no affiliation, but Revolut, you know, they have no problems that I've experienced. Uh, with having crypto profits sent there. So it, it, it is a relatively simple process as long as you know. I've also had bad experiences with, with, with banks, um, but you just need to find out which bank is crypto friendly because the, the process of making profits, sending it to Coinbase, uh, selling that to Fiat and sending it to the bank, I, I feel is very seamless. The only hard part is the bank. Uh, and if you can get a good bank. So I, I would say like Re Revolut like is one that I know is, is and I, I know it's very, very popular big bank um that i personally never have had problems with so that that's i think the main main thing is the is the bank and yeah revolut is one that i know is is good for that and that's an online bank so it's even easier yeah I've, i have had banks shut down and that's why you have to be a little bit careful because one day out of nowhere you can have your bank shut down and that's happened to me like five six times so, um, yeah, that, that's obviously super annoying. And I've actually had banks that I had, uh, I, a funny story, I had a, I had a bank which had a, a large sum of money in. And one day they messaged me saying, yeah, we're closing down your bank account. Um, and I was like, well, I need to withdraw my money. And they was like, yeah, you have 30 days. But then they have a withdrawal limit of like 50 grand a day. And so I, I couldn't withdraw the money. And then it reached the final day. And I was like, well, I, I still have money in the bank. Uh, and they're like, sorry, it's closed. <laughs> and then it had to go into a legal case where I'm now having to like sue this bank because they took still a load of money that I couldn't withdraw. Um, and they were just like, sorry, tough luck. And that was an online bank and it's super hard. But that was a bad experience. But Revolut, thankfully, I've not had that. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> just add one thing. Yes. I just wanted to add one thing to that. And if you look at why are the banks so uh, unfriendly towards crypto, well, banks are not your friend. You know, you're there to make money. And if you look at their potential competition, uh, you can see Tether, uh, other coins, uh, stable values. So they have an incentive, yeah, they have an incentive uh, to not let crypto users in. Um, and one way I've found to do this is by using a regulated broker to, uh, so I'll transfer money to the broker and then you can either buy stocks, you can buy ETFs, long-term holdings, uh, place some money into a 401k, somewhere that it cannot be touched, somewhere that it's tax advantaged. I mean, I know obviously that changes by country, by state, you know, wherever you are. Um, but yeah, that would be my thought. Any thoughts over here? Okay. Yeah, there's just one thing I would like to add to that, and that is um, I make sure to use banks that also offer investments. So if you look into institutional and uh, institutional banks, some of these banks, you aren't even able to buy stocks or something like that. So for Revolut, I know you can buy stocks, you can buy crypto. So I've never had any bad experiences with them. If I withdraw USDT, then send it to Euro or USD and then put it into Revolut, that's not a problem. And the German um, bank for that would be Comdirect. I've talked about that for my ETF investments, but also they are crypto friendly from my experience. So no affiliation with them, but uh, that's what I use. Okay, we have a couple more questions here. Yeah. Hi, my name is Thorsten. Um, I was wondering when you guys were talking about the first question regarding reaction of a level or being underwater, um, it's happened to me quite often that I see the reaction of a level, like the horizontal, for example, to 3%, three, three percent, and um, I see market structure change and I feel confident to get into the trade. Um, but after that, we get back to the level or even under my entry, entry level, I get on the border and then I start wondering what's the initial reaction that I wanted to see. If I should uh, wait for another reclaim of the level and um, then another market structure change again or if my reaction of the level was invalid. And um, yeah, that's happened to me uh, quite, uh, quite often uh, the last few weeks, a month. And um, yeah, that was my... Just to make sure I fully understand. So you, the question is like, you have your level set out and it will go underwater for a little bit. And then, you, then you're like questioning whether that was the right entry trigger. Is that what you mean, sorry? Yeah, if, my, if I see the initial reaction of the level and I get into the trade and after that coming back down again, so the, the reaction of the le level is sort of invalidated kind of. Yeah. And then I start wondering if that's the reaction that I wanted to see or okay, if yeah. my trade idea was wrong. Okay, yeah, so I get what you mean. So let's see, obviously there's several different, let's use swing failure pattern as, a, yeah. as an example, right? So let, let's say that you have your uh, heart previous high here and then you swing failure pattern through the level, you come back down and then you have your entry down and around, let's say a few hundred dollars below your entry, like the actual swing failure pattern high as an example. Um, and so then your entry trigger is really, really clear, right? You've entered because of the swing failure pattern. So then as price comes up uh, and above and then maybe back down below and you're in a bit of profits and then it comes back up again, I would, again, only for the example of swing failure pattern, but then I would say, even if it's like chopping around, so to speak, at that point there's still no real reason to close the trade even though you've come in a bit of profits it's coming now into maybe a little bit of loss it's above your entry i would still have to remain again you can look at things like the order flow and try and make an informed decision like there are times where you can close the trade early but let's say for 90 percent of the time you know it's best to just stick with your original plan so even if it's coming above and you'll then maybe you're thinking what's this is, is this a swing further pattern is this actually uh, just a continuation of the trend, just another high and higher low. I would say you have to really have conviction in your original uh, plan. So as, as it's coming back above and, and you're coming underwater, I personally would just have to be uh, almost like a good tip at severing with like sometimes it's better to walk away. So once you've got that entry and you've you've planned for that trade, you've took that plan. And this is why I also love swing trading as, as so much as well, because you can just walk away. You don't need to be monitoring it every five minutes, seeing it go underwater, see it come to profit, seeing it go underwater, because you are probably going to end up throwing away the trade unnecessarily. And so one good tip is simply like get that trade, walk away, set your stop loss, set your profits, 
take profits and, and just walk away. And that, that's the massive benefit, I think, of swing trading because you're not second guessing yourself. You're not thinking, was this right? Was this wrong? You're very, it's very easy to just be like, that's my trade. I'll come back tomorrow and see if it was wrong. What did I do wrong? And learn, like, see, okay, maybe if I, maybe this was the reason it was wrong and like learn from the mistake that you made. Um, or sometimes there is simply no mistake and it's just part of trading. Like you've done all your analysis right, the plan was good, but the trade lost, which is perfectly fine. Um, but swing trading is a, is a good way of doing this of just, that's the trade, that's the reason, walk away, journal it the next day, win or lose. Uh, but that, that, that's what I would say, isn't it? If you do the, the yeah, I agree. Yeah. yeah, there's one thing uh, I would add that really helped me, and that is having predefined or well defined entry triggers. So, what you will sometimes see if you watch my altcoin streams, for example, I can tell you weeks or days in advance which entry trigger I'm going to use. If it's going to be a candle close, if it's going to be a market structure change, or if it's going to be a loss retest type of entry. And once I get that trigger, so the first thing I do is obviously mark out my level. The level is hit, I get my alert, then I get my entry confirmation. Let's just say it's a candle close. If we look at an example of an SFP, I take the trade and then there's nothing else I can do. So if the position goes against me, that's fine. My entry trigger was there. If the position goes in my favorite direction and it revisits my entry, that's part of trading, but my entry trigger was there. So my um, trade is valid. And um, yeah, there's not, nothing else I can do. So I would say that really helps if you always know exactly which entry type you're gonna use, rather than just, okay, I see my level hit, I don't really know what to do, I'm just gonna take the trade. I'll just add that sometimes it's best to be a little bit late than too early. So sometimes you might have your alert, it goes through your alert, you take the trade, and then it drops a bit more, for example, if you're taking a long. Um, what I like to do is have the alert and call that as the arrival candle. So there's always, especially on the swing trade, just let it cook for a little bit, let it show that it is the level that it's going to hold because we never know for sure. You know, it could be a monthly, a weekly, it could be all the levels that make a point of control and test of value and it will just slice through like butter. So let it do its thing and when it shows you, okay, this is the level, then you can just buy a little bit later, have a different invalidation instead of like the low because that could be quite far away and then just take the trade, relax, take a walk and if it's a swing trade, just come back next day like Benny was saying and just keep it simple. And one thing I would add too is, is focus on your exits as much as you focus on your entries. Have a predetermined stop and, and journal about those because if it was the wrong place and maybe the wrong time, uh, you'll know that for next time that you need to pick a different spot. Um, and it's just as important to know where you want to get in as where you want to get out. Um, and then once you take the trade, there's really no way of knowing if it's going to be a winner or a loser. There's really no way. And so the best thing you can do is just have confidence in your setup, know that your invalidation is in place, and never, ever, ever run a trade without invalidation. I have done this. It was not good. <laughs> okay, yes, gentlemen right here. Have you ever got like a payment from Coinbase blocked by, I'm leaving UK, by UK, UK bank or by any other bank? Or was everything smooth? Yeah, no, I, I definitely had payments from the bank blocked. Uh, but they, from my experience, they're always very, very simple to solve. So that it's generally like source of funds. Uh, they'll ask maybe some uh, a list of transactions on the exchange. So they, they, they will get blocked, especially if it's high amounts. It's likely to be blocked. And, and what I find is it will be blocked the first few times you try and do it. But then as you build more of a relationship with this bank, they are going to be, okay, there's this amount coming in. It's uh, it's safe. Like He's already proved it a few times. But yeah, pro likely, especially with larger amounts, that it will probably get blocked. So that's why it's so important to uh, make sure you are um, having all of your logistics in terms of like a, a council good, like you're, you know, obviously paying taxes and everything you can prove because they all try and obviously block it if they can. Uh, you know, they're, they're not really your friends. Uh, so they, they will try a lot of things with this blocking, but if you can have it all proved, uh, this is my source of funds, this is where I originally deposited, these are all the trades, this is the profits, they, they cannot... Um, deny the payment right but they, they will try 100 percent. they're very likely they will try and block it because uh, i don't know why they, they they are a little bit they have to be cautious right they have to do their or they have to do their due diligence so uh 
Yeah, I, I would say I have had payments blocked, but I've always been able to just prove uh, whether it's a, a tax read or whether it's a source of funds. Uh, yeah, it's easy to prove and get past it in a few days. You just have to obviously be prepared and, and uh, tracking very well all of your orders, et cetera. Uh, it's, and, quicker and it's, it's quicker now. It's quicker now. Sometimes in the past it used to take a bit longer, but I think they're getting used to it now. Mm -hmm. A lot of people requesting these type of payments and things. And whereby it used to take like a couple of weeks, now you can have like quick responses as well uh, from banks and stuff. So, yeah. And this is where I think uh, personal accounting can come into play. Um, and something I've implemented just to make my personal trading business more professional is just, I have, a per I have a personal balance sheet. I keep track of all my profits, all my losses, all my expenses and everything so that if the tax man comes calling, I can say, hey, here are my receipts. Um, and fortunately with, with futures and other markets like stocks, it's not so hard, it's not so difficult. So if you're having trouble with crypto, um, wherever you're living, Maybe it's better to focus on different markets. Yeah. And if you're in the UK, HMRC is probably on to you anyway. <laughs> so they know about it. <laughs> All right. What's next? I bought crypto in 2016, quite a bit of it. I tried to buy a few thousand dollars off it a few weeks ago. The bank got a few this point blank. They have a reason on the website which says deposit all the scams. They find it necessary to protect it to their clients and it's not negotiable. So I went to two other banks in the country, had the discussion with them, and they don't even respond after I had personal meetings with them and they promised to come back to me. So it seems at least in my country there's for some reason a total unfriendly approach and I'm just wondering, I don't have experience of this really, but I know there are peer-to-peer -peer organizations where the organization is an intermediary and people deal directly with one another. Is it possible that we could potentially set up such a platform whereby just for security purposes maybe not under the name of Char Champions, but with our alignment with Bybit, for example, there may be an arrangement of an opportunity whereby our community can have Bybit or possibly uh, Char Champions or possibly a third organization under our control act as the intermediary only, but set up a peer-to-peer -peer platform where we can sell and buy from one another? I would say in terms of P2P, I, I've personally never used it, but I do know a lot of people that do. Um, but yeah, I, I personally do not have experience with P2P. And, and I'll be honest, like Chart Champions is not going to be interested in doing anything like that. Um, but all I would say is there will be people that know for sure. So it would be like, I, I would reach out to people in, in the community, um, I don't know someone at Bybit maybe knows something more, but uh, for sure, I, I have no experience on it, but I, I do know a lot of people like use it and it does help with like blocking up like the, like, like you basically say, like the banks, right? You then sell it to someone and they can send you the money and it's uh, a lot cleaner to get to your bank. Mm, but yeah, I've never used it. So I, I cannot really say too much. And, and I would say, yeah, chart champions, uh, that's not something that we would go down, but I would say use the community of like, hey, someone that's used it, because I'm, I'm sure someone's used it, they can give you a contact of someone that does this and then use that, I think is, is the best solution that I, I would think, honestly. Yeah, so I have some experience doing that. I wouldn't recommend it though, because um, that is how I bought my first Bitcoin. It was actually by accident, but I signed up for this P2P platform. And I just wanted to see how that process works because I was always curious on how to invest. I was investing in stocks and ETFs and I was like, okay, the missing part is crypto. So I signed up for this German platform. It was P2P. So I'm definitely sure you will find some platforms online that do that. Um, but then I was um, accidentally buying Bitcoin because uh, it was pretty easy. It was just like, yeah, um, I wanted to see how that process works. I was like, okay, there's this guy, he's offering 
this uh, specific amount of Bitcoin. I clicked onto it because I knew when you buy stocks, you have to confirm your purchase. And in this instance, it just said, congratulations, you bought this amount of Bitcoin. And I was like, wow, okay, that was all I had in my bank. And I was like, okay, do I really want to do that? I just, um, yeah, invested my entire money. So um, in the end, it turned out well, but um, it was a very, very scary process because I had to wait for like a week. So my money was gone and he had to send me the Bitcoin. And it was like, yeah, I had to trust this person. I even called him, he was sitting in France and I was like, yeah, I've never seen this person. He has my money, but I don't have his Bitcoin. So as I, I do prefer the, the, the route to go on exchanges, <laughs> to be honest, it was a scary, scary experience. But there are probably some good ones out there, but yeah, not my favorite. <laughs> Yeah, I, I've done similar. Uh, so I wanted to watch a, um, a TV uh, subscription services and they only accepted Bitcoin. And this was a long time ago. So I thought, okay, well, I need to buy some Bitcoin like in little amounts. Um, so I've done that peer to peer and it, it worked really well. Um, but I don't know. I just, it comes to a point in life that you have to be very careful. And um, yeah, I mean, that week that you were waiting for that Bitcoin from some Scary. stranger in France Scary. probably felt a bit like, hmm, is that gonna happen um, so you were lucky and this is it like I don't want to be hopeful um, with my so yeah that's why I always you know breach Coinbase because I know they go through a lot of scrutiny Um, you know it's a company listed on the Nasdaq uh, you can imagine the amount of paperwork bureaucracy they go through to be able to even have all of that stuff they're the custodial for um, EDFs um, so you know at least there I know you know you can buy a Bitcoin and keep it there and it's going to be okay well you hope it's going to be okay but at least you have that second layer of security and you're not trusting um, someone in France <laughs> <laughs> who knows and even with these crypto exchanges uh, I've gotten several emails in the last month very, uh, letting me know that if I don't continue with KYC which I've already done uh, you have to verify uh, regularly then they'll shut down the account and so I think what we're seeing now is sort of a regulatory uh, capture of the crypto space, which is a bad and a good thing, right? You, you hope that there is regulation so people have certainty, but the regulation is not always clean and it's not always fair. Um, and so I'd say if you can find a fair solution, one that works for you and your country, and you feel comfortable with it, then that's the best move. And uh, yeah, a lot of times that's through regulated uh, brokerage or banks, uh, which unfortunately do have some strings attached. And banks lend all their money. They don't have any. <laughs> so they need that. They need to keep the books in. Another question here? Yes. Like, what's a trade setup that you just can't pass up? Like, obviously, each one of you guys have your style. So maybe if you guys could each maybe just briefly talk um, about which setup each of you guys would take. If you see it on the charts, that way you can kind of give us, you know, some of us over here who don't know or. Some clarity on the setup or something like that. Thank you. Yeah, that's a great question. That's awesome, man. And uh, I think for me, uh, trading futures and mostly being a scalp trader, uh, I'm looking to be in the trade and in profits as quickly as possible. Um, and I want to have a stop close by. Um, and for me, the best trade setup that I can't resist is when we have a good pivot low or a good pivot high, and then price tests the VWAP, loses the VWAP, and then back tests it. And as long as market structure is also going in your favor, usually that back test or retest of the VWAP is absolute money. You know, and it may not play, it may not, it doesn't every time. But for me, the VWAP, the New York VWAP are two levels that I just can't resist. Um, I, I would say I have t two main setups that I can't resist, and it's changed recently because for like the past like four years, it was always swing failure pattern. So I would always just see a swing fire pattern, take the trade. And for me, it was, it needed to be at a major level, like a major high or low, but I would take every single swing fire pattern that I could see. Whereas now I do not take so much swing. I, I, I take them, but a lot more um, picky, a lot less often than what I was. So now my main like go-to setup that I absolutely love is um, on retracements, waiting for an uptrend anchored VWAP. And then on the on the uptrend line could be well, I would just like one other level of confluence. And that could for me perfect if it's a monthly, a weekly, 
Uh, I like it if it's like a higher term time frame as well, monthly, weekly, naked, point of control, or the um, if it's within a range and we're like pulling back within the range, I love it to line up with like the value area low. So I'm just looking for one like other major level to influence, not one in particular, um, but as long as it's the anchor view up of the uptrend, retracing. And one other thing that I would mention is I, I, I do prefer this if there is a clear trend. So there is a clear uptrend. And so we're pulling back to the anchor view up of the uptrend. And um, I'm just looking to get continuation of the trends. So pull back to that anchor view app. Love to see one other level of confluence. And for me, that's a really, really good buy because um, you know nine times out of ten, you got that. You, you first of all, you've not FOMO'd in. You've waited for a good pullback. You've got another level of confluence, and the invalidation will be based off a market structure. So maybe one or two higher lows back, depending on on how you know obvious that invalidation is. Like. We've clearly lost the trend. I want to be out of it. So I, for me, that's one that I've more, more, more over so maybe the past six or so months because I never used to trade that often. But I, I just need to trade swing fire patterns pretty much. And now I hardly trade swing fire patterns and I'm going for these anchored view ups. And if you trade altcoins, like this anchored view up is so amazing right now. You've seen it recently. It's, it's like every time you hit the anchored view up of an uptrend, it bounces. It's, it's really amazing. So that, that for me is... My go-to one at the moment, for sure. Yeah. I can share one from yesterday, for example. So some, sometimes it's very much like it's good to like say, oh, you know, I'm going to look for that trade. You know, it's it's going to be between this time and that time. But in the ideal world, like that's that's not what happens. Like when you set yourself to go, you know, I want that set up during that time. This is what I'm looking for that sometimes can be actually a bad thing because you're already setting too many rules for that trade to basically, for you to go look for that trade. And when really that trade more often than not actually comes to you. So yesterday we were all down, down, down there talking and I was looking at this and I saw 66, I hope you can all see it on the screen. So we had 66 exactly on Coinbase. And we all know from statistics that typically those numbers get a little bit, you know, not a push through. Um, and we have, it's a Friday. So context is always really important. And we spoke about that yesterday. So way before this whole thing play out and you've got like, it's a Friday. We've had a whole week of upside. So we are expecting a little pullback, but sometimes the clues are there. And you look at the chart, you've got like this kind of like ascending triangle. You have a high, you have 66, exactly mm. okay and then you have another fallback what do we have we have higher highs higher lows 66 another clue we come down to support and then when you just put a little line to say okay this is like an upsloping drift that is it right there so losing that 65 300 is pretty much okay lose that and we're going to see 64 64 and a half because that's just how the market works like breaks a low and then if it gets that follow through we'll go down so i thought you know that's a really nice place it's clear risk we have a clear target so getting that 65 300 target is 66 that's it and then we go forward and that's exactly what happens. I collapsed my trade at 6.6, six, so that's, that was 2.5K on that trade alone. And it was just, I didn't look for it. I just looked at the chart and the trade said, hello, I'm here, just by looking at the context. I know it may sound easy now, but it was, yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it was exactly that. And at the same time, you were building his short position. So at the time, it was, I was up 500, he was down 500. I was up. <laughs> Uh, down 500, you were up 500, and it was just for a little while. And it was amazing to see he's building a swing position, he wants the price to go up, but he's underwater. <laughs> and I was like, I want the price to go up now as well because this is my low. And it was really interesting to see two different trades coming into play, and they both played out. You, you were like, I wanted to go above 66 to clean the height to fill my short, and I was like, and I wanted to go there because this is my entry and that's my exit. And you can just see, like, we were both looking for two good trades, and there you go. And we got the rise, we got the drop, he's in profit, I closed my trade, he's number six, <laughs> number 12, and that's it. So just let it come to you. Sometimes if you go look for it, you're not going to find it. Let it come to you. Yeah, and my favorite setup is always going to be in confluence with supply and demand. So um, I've done the statistics and if you look at a naked value, for example, so a naked value area high, naked value area low, 
That in itself is a very good, good probability, but if you add a previous supply or previous demand zone onto that confluence, it adds 17% win rate on that already good statistic of a naked value. So that is always one of my um, best setups. And if we have a look at Bitcoin, so I might, um, if I can share something here. So um, always, sometimes it's difficult to give like the, f the favorite setup because it also comes down to context, obviously. But I want to give a one example here. So let's just say we're looking at Bitcoin and I'm looking at one of my favorite setups. So we are under the perspective that we have a good high on Bitcoin. That is step number one. I like the high. I'm looking for a pullback. I am not shorting right away. I'm waiting for weakness. So this morning, for example, I was seeing this retest of the previous day value area high. I'm trading on Bybit. So the Bybit value area high is up here. Okay, so that was what I was looking at. Value area high on Bybit was up here. Then I was looking at some previous supply and demand and I was seeing this right here. We had a little bit of demand also lining up with the previous day value area high. I like this high. This is number one. Retest of the previous day value area high. Number two, I have previous demand. Number three, this is a trade that I would take every single day. I took the trade, took profits, and I'm happy. <laughs> Um, Full no, disclosure, but... I wanted to take the same trade, but the IT guy took my lot. Uh, yeah, sure, it's true. true. <laughs> no, it's actually true. So. Um, but yeah, that is something I would always look at. And I look at this on crypto as well as on futures. So you, most of the time you will see me trade the setup on futures, but it also works on crypto, obviously. So um, yeah, that is my absolute favorite. I would take every single day of the week. Right. Thank you for these incredible questions. I've got a gentleman right here. Very short. When I joined, you started talking about the 6-6 six, six, and then recently you added the 7-1 and I just like for my own like way to figure out new analysis, I, I it's hard for me to understand, okay, like we're wicking through, so it's just a wick through or I've seen this enough times that maybe this is a new level or it's just something new, so could you talk more about that? Yeah, I, I, I would say there's, there's two perspectives that I would have on this of like the evolution or the changes of, of markets so there's yeah two ways that i would view it Num number one would be um let's let's say for example when we were using what uh everyone knew of the golden pocket so this is the 618 to 65 and so this then just it comes through pattern res recognition right so you're always looking for this retracement to the golden pocket and what in my opinion that why it start, started wicking through because if you look back at the golden pocket 6.5 it always hit the 6.5 and bounced and that's because if you go make it back even more people just looked at the 6.18 so for, for you know there never used to be like the golden pocket it was just people were taught like through wait for the 6.18 retracement in all the old trading books and so um, I feel that it goes like well everyone was so focused on 6.18 and then people started to recognize that oh, there is wicks now all the time you know, I, I was, you know, would view it like there was wicks all the time through the 618. Where is the average? That, of course, this is where it requires statistics. But then if your strategy is, let's say, buying the 618, you should be re recording, um, you know, how much drawdown through that candle is there. So, you know, if it's always hitting the 618 perfectly, perfect, you've got a trading strategy of buy that 618. But if your trading strategy is buy the 618 and then what was working, you start to know it's still working, but now there are bigger wicks through, that's where then the golden pocket gets created because then the, you can see, okay, sometimes it's about 618, but now more and more often there's wicks down through the 65. And then what I feel happens is the same like phenomena again, where everybody talked about the golden pocket. And, and I agree, I was using that at first as well. And so it used to hit the 65 and bounce, hit the 65 and bounce, hit the 65 and bounce. And there was continuously more and more you know, I was using the golden pocket, but then more and more there were, you know, just slight wicks through. And I feel that's because you could literally have a strategy of just buying the six five and having your stop loss, you know, let's say a few hundred dollars away given the percentage, but a really tight stop loss and you could use that as a strategy. And then I feel that the markets get, you know, they catch on, so to speak, and you know, um too many people started to use the six five and that's then where uh, you know, through time and reporting statistics, I felt oh, the six six it's close, but that little bit of extra margin um, was more often than not based on the statistics actually hitting the six six. And then it's like recently with the seven one, right? You you start to recognise like things are changing, 
Um, and it, it's just the only way you can recognize that is through statistics building. That's why it's so important to record every single trade that you're taking. Um, and where I bounce that onto like point number two is that I feel there's always like a flavor of the half year, let's say. So every, every six months, it just seems to change. And I have no real reason behind this. Uh, to be honest, I don't, I, I'm not the type of person that thinks into why is this changing so much? I just see it's changed. It's time to adapt. Um, so I do not have a reason of why it changes, but I notice, uh, for example, the swing failure patterns. So I was using that for so much. And then only through statistics, I just see my well, swing failure patterns aren't as good anymore. Uh, it will hit a swing failure pattern, then it would less FP, the SFP. Oh, now it's SFP, the SFP of the SFP. Like if I was stuck in my way, I'd just be like, oh, I'm just trading swing failure patterns. And I wouldn't realize, well, oh, it's not really working as good as it once was. And it's only through that realization, through the statistics, this is not working as good anymore. Okay, now let's move on. Oh, then, for example, now I'm using the anchored view app a lot. And and that's again just through my experience and statistics i can see that that is now what's working really good but in another six months maybe you know we're hitting the anchor view up and we just keep trading through it all the time and so i don't know when that will be it could be tomorrow it could be in another year but at some point for sure it's not going to work and at that point i need to see okay so now we're going through the anchor view but what's it bouncing off of now is it for example going back and bouncing off of cc is it is it uh, now, you know, it's the flavor of the month sort of thing coming in and forming harmonics with deeper retracements. Are we now looking for Gartley's continuously? You know, we went for a period where we would always get Gartley's. It went CC, CC, 786, like, and so, yeah, that, that would, I, I do, I, I do not have the reasons behind these changes. I think it's just important to point journal, every trade, record the statistics. And then when you start to see, it doesn't, you don't need to leave it too long. It can be 10 trades. You start to see, oh, this strategy that I'm using that was once extremely high win rate now is not becoming so good. It comes on to that relatively early and, and see, okay, I, I lost this trade today. I lost this trade, you know, 10 trades, let's say, and you've seen they're now losing trades or not the best entry trades. And then in your journal, you should be recording like where was the best entry in hindsight. And then hopefully you would see over those that those 10 trades but well, actually instead of using the cc this time if i had used the anchor view up well that would have been the trade and that's when you start to say okay that's the new strategy of the month of the month it lasts longer than one month but that's the new flavor of the month so to speak so that's the way that i would from my experience like work around it and yeah that, that would be my answer does anyone know what this ticker is yeah yeah the etf so so, so the way I've been looking at Bitcoin more recently, because the question goes into, um, you know, the evolution of technical analysis. So we're looking at the ETF, and for some of you trading crypto, you know that crypto has evolved a little bit. It's a little bit different to trade than what it used to be a few years back. And we had the FTS, FTX, you know, ordeal, and since then it's been a little bit skewed, um, low volume, low liquidity. And, you know, I have been looking at the ETF as a gauge for the market because when you look at long-term investments, um, you know, these are, these, these are how they start. You know, they start small and then they just, you know, gradually over years, we talk 10, 10, 20, 30 years, people put their pension funds 1%, 0.5% into these things. So when you look at the inception, we start at $50. So I like the, uh, um, the ARK one because it's very similar to price in relation to what BTC is, for example, right now it's 6610, that's when it closed on Friday. And you know, the price of BTC now on Coinbase is around the same time, uh, you know, price like obviously 66k. So I like that to, to, to compare it with. But you can see here, here's the inception. What I liked about this chart is that it kind of like marries obviously Coinbase, which is nice. But I treat this as a five minute chart and I treat this as your supply and demand, you know, back tests. And it's just how it beautifully came back down to the uh, free match inception. And that was like a really great place to get in on this ETF. And, and you even had the back there. So the way I look at this chart is I would like to see that high. And that high will be about you know, obviously 75K. So if, if, if price breaks this low, in my opinion, you know, we are going to go below inception, which is really like for long term investments. Um, you know, let's say that all of those institutional traders that came into the space, they will obviously be underwater. So it's their best interest as a new asset, a brand new ETF on this new crypto space to at least maintain that above $50.
And so, you know, that's the way I'm looking at this, but I love how it resembles um, the, um, I mean, this is the daily chart here on the, um, what's it called, the CME. And I love that that 200 long-term daily moving average is still pointing up. So the analysis is still on point, but it's more for that nice swing trading. I think in my opinion, less is more now on crypto. And yeah, it's, you know, the evolution, yeah, we need to look at what the big boys are doing over in the uh, Wall Street. And yeah, there's a lot of pension funds coming into this. And um, so this space is maturing. Um, the average retail trader that we had back in the days uh, is a bit more informed. Obviously, Chat Champions has contributed somewhat towards that because we are a little bit more at it. We, we know what to expect. We're not just buying because we can buy. We're not selling because we can sell. We're actually looking at levels. We're looking at confluences. We're looking at risk management. And I hope you are taking this in because that's all you have to do. So yeah, zoom out and look at the bigger picture. So start with the ETF. Um, I mean, we could draw all sorts of lines um, and they all point to a massive range. We've got January high still at 70K. We do have the pit stop at 71, which is every time I drew the box, we get there and we come back down. So potentially we could come back up to that box and reverse, the, you know, reverse again. But I'm still in the opinion that this back test here, which is like when you put the line chart, which just measures the closes, that still looks like a good chart to me. High time frame. So um, yeah, I like Bitcoin. Bitcoin's our baby. Yeah, man. <laughs> right. So yeah, the evolution of trading and technical analysis. Um, yeah, we, we got to look for the ETFs, CME. Um, uh, it's it's refreshing to see the micros now. I've been monitoring the volume on the micros, and micro, the volume is increasing. So soon we'll be like a trading S and NQ. And, and hopefully, right, the fees are $7, no, $5.70 to open the micros. That's really expensive when you think about it. Because to trade with one yes is what, $3.00, under $3.00, a two-way trip. That's cheap when you think about it for a quarter of a million position size. So we want BTC to be the same, but it's still a very young asset. You know, the, the, the brokers need the volume to be able to say, okay, we've got thousands of lots coming in in a minute. Okay, I can offer you $1.50. And when that day comes, we're going to be like, spot on. Because we can, <laughs> yeah, I mean, it's, it's the fees. You want to you wanna trade. You want to put those trades in. But if you're going to pay a lot of fees, you need to wait for that bigger trade that at least justifies you putting $50 risk even before the trade starts moving. Because as soon as you press five or 10 micros, you're down $50. Uh, that's it, that you, you're under. And then tip, technically, like typically, I mean, it, it comes down a little bit if you're put, putting along. So you have to account for all of that. So if you're doing day in, day out, that's a lot of cash that you're just putting there for those fees. So I see more volume coming in, more micros being traded. That's good news. Uh, yeah, so good. Nice. It's maturing. So technical analysis is, yeah, it's maturing over the years. So we need to look at the source. And we're looking at it now. All right, can we get a round of applause for those questions and answers? Yeah.